In the last chapter, we have introduced the formal world of sets in order to avoid paradoxes. In this world, sets are containing other sets, but it is not guaranteed that any class of sets could be packed into a set. For example, there is no set corresponding to the set of all the sets. The entire world of sets can be also seen as an enormous directed graph. The vertices represent sets and edges the set membership. So, sometimes we will call the objects of the formal world of set theory sets, sometimes elements, but formally they are the same. The only difference is in the way we perceive them. The axioms of set theory will guarantee that this world will mostly behave as expected. They consist of 10 basic assumptions about sets, from which all the rest will follow. In this video, we are going to introduce and slightly motivate these assumptions. The first, or rather the zeroth axiom, gives us at least something to start with, the empty set. Otherwise, we could think that maybe there are no sets in the world of formal sets. The empty set is simply a set that doesn't contain any other set, so it has no incoming edges in the graph view. On the other hand, there can be outcoming edges. The empty set can be a member of other sets. However, the axiom of existence itself doesn't tell anything about how many empty sets there are. In theory, we could have a blue empty set and a red empty set and could distinguish between them. According to mathematicians, sets are not supposed to behave like this. To prevent this, there is the next axiom of set theory, the axiom of extensionality. Put simply, the elements of a set should be the only information determining a set and it cannot happen that two different sets would correspond to the same class of elements. Once two sets have the same elements, so in the graph view they have incoming edges from exactly the same vertices, they also must be the exact same sets. Side note, now it can look like that the three white elements defy the axiom of extensionality, but it is just because we do not draw the entire world of sets and the white elements contain other things which make them distinguishable. The end of the side note. So far, we have introduced two basic axioms of set theory. Now let's think about how to build a set. For example, with the following axiom. Every finite class is a set. So whenever we take a finite class of elements, we can pack them into a set. There is another element of the world of formal sets, such that exactly the given elements are pointing to it. This is indeed true in set theory and it could be an axiom, but mathematicians prefer axioms as basic as possible. So rather than stating that any finite number of elements can be packed into a set, they provide tools with which we can do it. For example, like these. One axiom will state that whenever we have an element in the world of formal sets, we can construct a singleton set containing exactly this given element. And the second axiom will guarantee that there are unions of pairs. So whenever we have two sets, there is also their union, the set containing all the elements of both sets. Using these two axioms, we can construct any finite set. We take the given finite number of elements, first we pack each of them into a singleton set, and then, using the union of pairs, we start by joining the first two singleton sets, then we added a third set to the result, then the fourth set, and we could also continue if we had more elements. In the end, we obtain what we wanted, a finite set containing exactly the given elements. And we reached this using quite basic operations, creation of a singleton set and the union of a pair. However, mathematicians went with the search for foundations even deeper. Any of these two constructions still isn't a real axiom of set theory. The union of two sets is still considered as two operations together. First, we use the axiom of pairing. It states that whenever we take two elements, sets, we can pack them into a new set containing exactly them. It is analogous to the singleton construction. After that, we use the axiom of union. In general, this axiom is not just taking the union of a pair of sets, but of all the sets contained in a given set. We can also draw it as erasing the internal boundaries. These two axioms together construct the union of two given sets. 
Now I should emphasize one property of formal sets which comes from the underlying concept. There is nothing like multiplicities of elements in a set. A set B either doesn't contain a set A or it does. We imagine that set B contains each of its elements exactly once, but the main reason for this is that there are only two binary options, either there is a membership between A and B or there is not. This means that if we somehow construct a set that contains one element x multiple times, for example by the axiom of union, the information about the multiplicity is lost, so we end up with all the identical members merging into one. The same holds for the axiom of pairing. We can apply the axiom of pairing to two identical elements, but because the set cannot contain one element twice, we actually construct a singleton set. This is the reason why we don't need an extra axiom for singletons. With this observation, we have finished the axioms allowing us to construct any finite set. Let's go on. The last axiom of basic construction is the axiom of separation. This axiom states that whenever we have a set A and a rule in the language of formal set theory, for example that we take only the odd numbers, we can look at each element whether it satisfies the given rule or not, take only the elements satisfying the rule and pack them into a set. We already know that if we hadn't started with a set, we couldn't just take any set of sets satisfying a given rule. We have seen the issues in the last chapter. The axiom of separation is the closest one to such a natural construction of a set, just that there must be a superset to start with. The axiom of separation is also useful for taking intersections. Let's take two sets, A and B. Our rule is the element is a member of B and we apply the axiom of separation to set A. Only the elements of B satisfy the rule, but we are not looking outside A while applying the axiom. So we construct the intersection of A and B. Personally, I consider the axioms of existence, pairing, union and separation as the axioms of basic constructions. Even just axioms of existence and pairing will make the world of formal sets infinite. We can pack sets into pairs and create new and new pairs. On the other hand, there is no guarantee so far that there are any infinite sets. We are going to introduce axioms for working with infinity soon. But first, let's recall the construction of a large set from the beginning of the fourth chapter about transfinite recursion. We started with the set of natural numbers, with omega. Then we considered the power set P of omega, the set of all subsets of omega. We repeated this operation twice, three times, and we continued over all the natural numbers. And finally, we took the union of these sets, obtaining a set larger than all the sets before. This is really a showcase construction for the axioms of set theory. We start with omega, the set of all the natural numbers. And indeed, the next axiom, the axiom of infinity, basically states that there is the set of all the natural numbers. It is not exactly like that and so far it is said a bit vaguely when we don't know yet what a natural number is, but let's leave it at that for now. We will take a closer look at this axiom, at the definition of a natural number, at the 11th chapter about formal numbers. Let's get back to our construction. The next step is constructing the power set, the set of all subsets. And that is exactly the next axiom. The axiom of power set states that for any set we can construct its power set. Using this axiom over and over, we construct the entire sequence of larger and larger sets. The question now is how to take the union of all these power sets. We are going to use again the stronger version of the axiom of union. Whenever we have a set of sets, we can take the union of all of its elements. However, to apply this axiom, we first need to pack all of these power sets into a single set. This will be handled by another axiom, the axiom of replacement. Whenever we have a rule on how to replace an element for another and a given set, we can apply the rule to all of its elements and pack all the results into a new set. If it feels too general, it should get clearer on the example. We don't know yet whether there is a set containing all the power sets, but the bars here represent natural numbers. And we already know that there is a set of natural numbers. 
it follows from the axiom of infinity. To every natural number n, we assign the n times iterated power set of omega. That is our rule. So 0 goes to omega, 1 goes to p of omega, and so on. Therefore, the axiom of replacement allows us to also pack all the n times iterated power sets into a set. Finally, we apply the axiom of union to this set and obtain the desired result. I would just like to highlight one more technical detail here. The axiom of extensionality was actually also necessary. That's the axiom stating that a set is determined only by its elements and by nothing else. Why did we need it? When we want to use the axiom of replacement, we need a unique description of the result for every number. And our description to replace a number n with the n times power set of omega is indeed unique, but only thanks to the axiom of extensionality. Without it, there could be multiple different such power sets, even though with equal elements. So the rule would point to multiple different results at once, and as such it would be an invalid rule for the axiom of replacement. Fortunately, we have the axiom of extensionality, so this cannot happen, every number is converted to a unique set, and we can happily use the axiom of replacement. Well, I'm not sure how clear this explanation was, just take from it that the axiom of extensionality isn't here just for fun. We have discussed almost all of the axioms, just two axioms remain. One of them was quite controversial in the past, now it is widely accepted and we will look at it in detail in chapter 13. Vaguely speaking, it states that we can make an infinite number of unorganized choices at once. Formally, the statement is as follows. Whenever we have a set of non-empty disjoint, that is, non-intersecting sets, we can take exactly one element from each of these sets and form a new set out of them. At first glance, it doesn't look very spectacular and in many cases we can actually use other axioms instead of choice. But when we need to make an infinite number of unorganized choices at once, we don't really have a better option. And the last axiom, the axiom of regularity or also the axiom of foundation, is listed here rather for completeness. It states that it cannot happen that a set would contain itself or there would be a set containing a set containing a set and this would continue forever. But of course this vague intuition is not exactly what the axiom states. Its formal statement is as follows. Whenever we have a non-empty set, at least one of its elements is, as a set, disjoint with the original set. They have no element in common. Well, it doesn't really look like what I have been describing before, does it? So, once I have opened this, let's outline the connection. Imagine that there is the tunnel we've discussed, a set containing a set containing a set and so on up to infinity. Let's draw this in the graph view. It is an infinite sequence of backward arrows. Using other set theoretical axioms, it is possible to pack this sequence into a set. However, no matter which element in this set we choose, the element contains the next element in the sequence, so it is not disjoint with our infinite set. This contradicts the axiom of regularity, so by the axiom of regularity such a set cannot exist, and therefore even the set we started with cannot exist. There is also another role of the axiom of regularity. It helps to classify the class of all the sets into a certain hierarchy, but this is rather out of the essence of set theory. So if you are interested, just look up von Neumann Universe on Wikipedia. In basic set theory, the axiom of regularity is not too important and mathematicians sometimes even intentionally abandon it. So we are not going to discuss it in detail anymore and finish our introduction to axioms. It has already taken longer than I would like to. In the end, try to pause the video, look at the list of the axioms we have just discussed and recall what are the axioms responsible for. As the most important axioms, I would personally pick extensionality, union, infinity, power set, replacement and choice, also because all the other axioms except regularity could be derived from them. But we probably agree that more impressive than the axioms themselves is the fact that these few axioms are sufficient 
for building the entire mathematical universe. Next time, we are going to start with that. We will have a look at the Cartesian product and see the connection between a graph, a graph and a graph. See you then!